Jack Schneider. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts. I'm Jennifer Berkshire, and I am a writer, and I teach in the journalism program at Boston College and the education studies program at Yale. And we are the co-hosts of a podcast, Have You Heard, as well as the authors of a book and a half. A book and a third <laughs> might be a more accurate description. It is, in other words, a book that is very much in progress. Yeah, that book is in progress because it turned out that with our last book, A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, we were right about a lot of the things that we predicted and maybe accidentally a little bit too optimistic about how things would turn out. That's absolutely the case. And our next book is really meant to be uh, almost like a guide for regular people who now understand that the schools are essentially under siege and they want to help. They want to do something about it. Right. Yeah, in A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, we thought maybe the assault on public education was a decade away or maybe five years away. And so one of the things that we tried to do was outline the ideological underpinnings of the attack on public education. So we described things like the drive to reduce the cost of public education, which is really rooted in the idea that government shouldn't exist, that taxation is a kind of encroachment on personal liberty. We described also the fact that the push against public education is very much rooted in anti-unionism. When, um, when we talk to groups, we often get the question, where did you come up with the idea for the book? This is one of Jack's favorite questions. And on the one hand, the idea came from, from seeing the sort of the attacks on, on public schools that were really coming from both political parties. But for me, a lot of the inspiration for the book came from my travels around the Midwest and seeing how virtually every Midwestern state had a conservative billionaire and one of their pet projects was rolling back all kinds of regulations but really getting rid of public education. And fast forward to today and we are seeing that vision absolutely flourish in state after state. Everything from school vouchers to rolling back child labor laws. And right now, one of the things that we hadn't actually talked about in A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door is that this push to dismantle public education, which is rooted in anti-regulation, as you were just talking about, in anti-unionism, in a desire to cut costs, and in a drive to elevate private values over the public good, it's now being coupled with culture war in this really effective way where folks who ordinarily would be against any proposal to undermine public education. I'm thinking particularly of people in rural areas for whom public schools are the lifeblood of the community, but because of the effective deployment of culture war have now been convinced in many cases that the public schools are now seized by woke educators, by Marxists and communists, uh, by groomers, and really it's all advancing the kinds of aims that we outline in A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. And I think that our hope was that people would read that book and that it would wake them up that they would, they would recognize that a lot of policy items that seem like they don't have anything to do with one another right. are actually part of a, a broader vision. And I think in many ways that has turned out to be a success, that the book definitely woke people up. But one of the challenges is that we are so used to heaping blame on our schools mm -hmm. and you know they've disappointed us in so many ways, sometimes you know for very good reasons, but sometimes because we ask our schools to do things to solve problems that they can't possibly do on their own. It's made the act of rallying around public education as an essential part of our democracy that much harder. Yeah, one of the things that we talk about in the book is the fact that actually people who are supporters of public education engage in a lot of the same kinds of rhetoric that opponents of public education engage in, right? So a lot of my research is in how we can advance equity in our democracy. And one of the ways that advocates of equitable education have tried to do that is by making the case that school funding is inadequate and uneven across states and across neighborhoods, that our schools are getting more segregated, that in many cases teachers have been handcuffed by existing assessment and accountability regimes, and 
that turns out to also play exactly into the hands of folks who don't want public schools to exist in the first place. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. And one of the things that's become so apparent to us is that we have got to figure out another better rhetoric for talking about schools. So Jack mentioned that we have a podcast and we just did an episode that I think ended up being both of our favorites, among our favorites. We did an interview with a, a young academic named John Shelton who has a fantastic book called The Education Myth. And it's about how our understanding that schools are the vehicle for economic opportunity is actually a pretty recent idea. And that what it's done is not just, you know, left a kind of political disaster in its wake, but it's sowed incredible disappointment with the schools because they can't be the only thing that delivers economic opportunity. And I think it really reminded us of how we lack uh, rhetoric about the common good. And both of our goals for the next book is to help people start to, to get that language back. Right, because otherwise what we end up with is a future in which some of the things that we outline in the last third of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door will absolutely come into being. So in that book, we talk about things like the rise of for-profit schools, the rise of virtual schools, the rise of micro schools, the rise of a new version of teaching in which teaching is gig work rather than professional work. And all of that is possible if each of us thinks of schooling just as a way for our own children to get ahead, right? If that's the purpose of schooling, why on earth are we funding it with our tax dollars? you ought to be funding your own kids education and if you don't have the money for it then why should taxpayers contribute to an equal education for that child if the only purpose is to prepare that young person for work maybe a virtual school that really involves that kid on uh, a tablet all day long will suffice we we would jokingly refer to the last third of our book as the black <laughs> mirror section because i think in many ways what we were doing is we were taking the arguments that were being made trying to explain where they came from but also what the implication was for the future right. and the experience of writing the next book which i believe is called defending our public schools something, something like, like that. that it's a title tbd what's really different is that we don't have to predict anything right. because the future that we warned about is being rolled out so quickly. Yeah, so if people aren't aware, all they have to do is do a little internet research to read about what's happening in states like Arizona or New Hampshire or Florida or Iowa. There are so many examples right now, basically any place where the state legislature has a Republican majority. And in many cases, these are Republican legislators whose constituents Actually, if they were fully informed about what the consequences of things like voucher bills are, would be adamantly opposed to them. In fact, a lot of these bills end up being snuck through uh, under the cover of darkness. I think one of the things that we're really hoping is that we can get conversations started in the states where people actually object to right. these policies and we can come in and help them understand where this stuff is coming from. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be people on the ground in, in these states that, that really start to push back, but also make the case that, that the futures of their states rely on having a, a well-funded public education system. Yeah, I think our most successful work as advocates of public education and as people who are trying to stand shoulder to shoulder with folks on the ground advocating for the existence of public education uh, is in helping inform them through the book about what the larger play is in terms of dismantling public education as well as you know what are some of the things that communities are doing to stand up for their public schools.